Hello, my name is Margarita Bassi, but I go by Maggie. I am a senior, and today I will be reading three different poems. The first one is called Paper Boats. Today I bartered with a man in the bazaars of Rishikesh, India, for a garnet ring. His shop sat behind foggy glass and tarnished silver. Dogs licked the beads of the skirt I wore, the skirt that tripped me as I stepped over the threshold he swept with obsessive strokes of a shedding broom. Light-headed from the heat piercing my temples and scared of the men that shadowed me on either side of the Ganges, I wanted to scream that it's not just the dust and the arches of our feet that he must guard against, but also the particles that mix with the sweat on our skin and cling to the links of our eyelashes and line the half-moons of our nails. But I assumed he didn't speak English. I wanted his smile to be like a poem. Stark white teeth against chocolate-colored skin, but I also assumed the only paleness of him would be the white triangles of his eyes, as he eyed my tattoo as I eyed the religion painted gold between his brows. I imagined splinters in his fingertips, like the ones scarring the knees of the beggars I could look at quickly but not see, and maybe if the cleaner he used on my ring could pour from the cracks in the sky in the wake of lightning, our eyes would water less from the haze that muffles the thunder. How to say, I am tired, I am far from home in Hindi. But the paper he drew from his pocket, I could read. And even if I couldn't, he would tell me because he spoke English. The sheet he showed me will never be folded into the paper boats I watched barefoot children sail beneath the suspended bridges. The script was cursive and said that the dog who pushed his wet nose against my toes has a home waiting for him in Canada. And the one that liked to chew the bells of my sandals is eagerly awaited for in France. If only all the strays in the streets of Rishikesh might find their way behind the foggy glass and tarnished silver to the man with a shedding broom. And I think that if I tried to clean this nation with silver polish, the dust might melt, but the land would burn. Today I bartered with the man of the bazaars of Rishikesh, India, for a lesson in poetry that is not the shape of the smile, that teaches failure is not the dust of the streets, and now I hear verse in the garden of my ring. My next poem is called Poverty Waltz. My grandmother said that back in her day, there was so much poverty it learned how to dance. It was Modena, Italy, 1944, when she started splitting her meals with her dog, Bobby, and her best friend fell in love with an Australian soldier. My grandmother walked barefoot to a barn party to avoid ruining her tango shoes and only let that boy twirl her when the chaperone was looking the other way. The barn floor creaked under their weight because it covered a bomb shelter the farm family used when the alarm sounded in the distant village. They left their windows open at night to make sure they heard it or the screams. My grandmother met my grandfather when she was 14 and he was 18, but love sees no age It saw how my grandmother swayed and how my grandfather wanted to sway with her, and so he pulled at her skirt and robbed poverty of its dance partner. My great-grandmother said that there was no place for a woman like home, so she woke my grandmother at 5 a.m. on Sundays because, sure, it's a holy day, but holy cow, do these floors need to be washed, and your future husband can wait in the backyard. My grandmother said they were locked in a death dance because they started to waltz under the hay roof of the barn and only stopped the night my grandfather died, and then misery returned for its dance partner. My last poem is called Nowhere with nothing to do. You say, let's go to a place with white curtains and wooden floors to walk barefoot, where the ocean quietly mumbles outside our window, or perhaps there are trees whose star-shaped leaves tap against the glass. I say, it should be a place that is nowhere with nothing to do. We'd lay in a bed of cream and mahogany carved with seashells and birds, and we'd trace the wood with our fingertips when we raise our arms and stretch our legs, and I'd ask if you remember that time we swam naked in the sea, with the sun heavy on our shoulders and the Mediterranean in our eyes. You'd kiss me like you did then, and then we'd watch the stars, and we'd name every constellation we never have the time to notice now, because we live and breathe cement and stone, but not if we go to the house that is nowhere, with nothing to do. We'd do it all slowly, wondering if God exists and screaming his name in the devils down valleys of red poppies. Let's go to a place where the wind and the earth and the sun speak in different tongues, and we'd speak the language of touch and teeth while they chatter about us. It would be small, in a big place, and maybe I'd say I feel like a child again, but also as old as the trees whose ribs are orbited with centuries of rings. I'd ask if you remember that time we both cried in the theater lobby. 
In this place that is nowhere with nothing to do, you'd ride a bike and I'd ride that same bike by sitting on the handlebars and you'll lean forward and you won't mind my hair in your face as you whisper, do you believe in soulmates? We'd both say no, but we'd sit before the temple of coincidence that brought us here at this time with these scars on our bodies and these stains on our fingertips, knee to knee, breast to breast. I'd ask if you remember that time we ate cheap burritos in that stairwell in that library in Paris when we thought we knew each other, and we did. But somehow it was like the first time again. But nowhere is like Neverland, and nothing is like everything is like those places that tickle our collarbones and dreams. You ask me if I'm still scared of the dark. I say yes, but I turn the lights off, and for a moment it is as if we were in a place that is nowhere with nothing to do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dylan Cooper, and I will be reading from The End of My Senior Thesis, a two-part work in creative nonfiction, which explores my experience in the coastal cities of Providence, Rhode Island, and Venice, Italy. The poem might as well be its own translation, or a passage from Jeremiah's prophetic literatures, even older. Stand at the crossroads and look, it says. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it. They're similar enough in my own interpretation on my near obliviousness about how to live a good life, or which places I should go, or what would be different if I chose one space over another. Maybe all of our stories are translations of the same things. Hevel, they say, meaningless, utter nonsense, absurdity. Only perhaps that word has been translated too harshly, and should be taken literally. Vapor, they would read instead. All is vapor, the merest breath. Truth is complex. All we can do is try to be at the right place at the right time, and faith, which we all have in one thing or another, is impossible without mystery. And what of Venice? I still have an app on my phone that tells me the city's tide predictions for the next three days. There's a scale of green to red, with green meaning the sea is safely below 60 centimeters, and red anywhere above 120. An exceptionally high tide, the caption says, objectively and coldly, with no picture of what an exceptionally high aqua alta looks like or feels like. The app refuses to predict above 150 centimeters, as far as I can tell. It stayed there stubbornly, even when four months ago the tide surged to 187 centimeters above normal sea level, 30 higher than the flood I witnessed, and only seven shy of the 1966 deluge, the worst in recorded history. I could hardly look at the photos. I drew such a strong line in my head between the flood waters of the lagoon and the depression which sank over my eyes for several weeks of my time there. It felt like water in my brain, at least and seeing murky water simultaneously creeping over the edges of a city which I had begun to love, but still didn't feel like home, is one of the strangest experiences in my memory. Incredible and heartbreaking, captivating, frightening, and chillingly mesmerizing. I can barely imagine what it would have looked like in November. I suppose we find ways to conceptualize climate change, something so huge and easy to detach from ourselves that we need to find ways to personalize it. Watch it creep over a place you love, Associate it with a period of depression that took months to process and heal from, which I am arguably still doing. At least I still struggle to make sense of it all. In November, I spent a week looking at the photos, tracking the tides, reading reports. They were triggering. The lagoon still sits behind my eyes. Periodically, I am thrown back to the smell of wet stone, lukewarm water running into my boots, the way I would lie awake at night, cloudy-minded, listening to the water moving just 20 or so yards from my window. When, from time to time, I find myself writing again at three in the morning, I am there, watching the foggy streetlights, opening the window to a certain kind of desolation, too easily forgotten. At the same time, it could not be further away. It's hard to conceive of a real place when you are not there, hard to imagine it operating the way it always did, the Vaporetti sticking to their schedules, the same girl at Madre Bakery, serving coffee, not remembering me. In many ways, the place has turned back into a fairy tale in my mind, and only a bit over a year later, I am healthy again, enough that sometimes I choose not to remember what it felt like to be depressed, in what was sometimes a morbidly depressing place. I've returned frequently to the relationships between the words apocalypse and revelation, particularly that the first, the Greek apocalypsis, meaning unveiling, received its current connotation from the second, when the revelation of John at the end of the New Testament became interpreted as a book about the end times, the eschaton, the destruction of the earth. They are such different words. Apocalypse, fear, death, darkness, water creeping forward without a care for what it drowns. Revelation, newness, wonder, and worship. Perhaps they still go together. 
I'm not up for the challenge of justifying it linguistically or biblically or ecologically. I've just experienced that my healing has been a long process of talking and writing, and allowing myself to feel things so deeply I can hardly stand it. Seeing Venice go underwater again, from afar this time, and so much deeper than it did when I was there, reminds me to do so, maybe. Not to cast off my depression as a thing of the past to be left behind, left in Venice. Not least because I know there will be seasons of darkness to come again. To recognize that because of it, I saw a beauty in that city I believe I never would have otherwise. And we carry our places with us, I know. I read the revelation about a week after I returned from Venice, in the haze of my mind recovering, finally breathing again but still not okay, still hurt and exhausted and lost. Chapter 21 calls for a new creation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. People sometimes read it as a text which devalues the physical world, casting it off as disposable and in need of destruction before it can be made new, even going so far as to envision a creation in which the sea will be no more. At the very least, it is interpreted as though our, the earth and our bodies are only transitory, a training ground for the restored creation that is to come. I liked that reading then. At least I wouldn't have minded some spiritual reality that blotted out or silver-lined the one I was living. But now I really don't think any reality could or should do away with the physical world, even with all its flooding and destruction, nor should any current version of myself push away at my past experiences. Not only am I unable to speak of myself without tracing my life in these threatened coastal cities, but my heart needs to break for Venice every now and then when it floods, or when I am reminded that even as it survives, it sinks in my memory. I cannot remember it perfectly, not the maps I once carried in my body, not the melody of the six o'clock bells, or exactly the way the light shook on the dark water of the canal at night. My heart breaks in advance, for the day when I imagine the Narragansett will begin creeping over Providence, and I will no longer be able to walk those old city streets. Just as my heart broke some weeks ago, as I found myself suddenly leaving the campus which had been kind to me the past four years, evacuated by a virus that again uprooted my habitual way of living, this time in a matter of days, where I am sure I will return, but will no longer call home. I feel for it sometimes, the loss. Likewise, when I let myself remember my own darkness in these places, it is a gift to do so. The revelation from apocalypse, if apocalypse has not become too strong a word. In any case, I have a story to tell of goodness coming from darkness, of learning to be at peace with the things I do not understand and to ask for the ancient paths. Or it is just that we are human, and we create meaning, almost always, out of vapor. Hi, my name is Erica Macri, and today I'll be reading a few of my poems. On the LIRR 1982, where you see the trains cross, there you see how recklessly they cross, and the cream-colored van is eternally nice and young high schoolers. They can drive for a little, but will never get far past the liminal lights, a border with eyes flashing. In absolutes, they die, but you believe there is an order of operations that carries us through the misshapen universe, and you can adjust the physics of a single crash, the gravest of trolley problems. If you believe this, then maybe the train and van simply brush mechanical hearts, never exacting our engine's ruthless toll. Precursor. She had my name, this creature born unraveling, a girl once young and always little, who never made a shadow under a riddling noon by the Sphinx's sundial. She was born out of time, a chirp from up in a timber tree, this great aunt of mine. And all this a blunder, no one thought to tell my mother she had my name. Lethe. In my dreams, you were dying. I woke to the mystery of where you went to. So now I imagine you roving a shadow by night. Did you vanish, or were you, with everything else, engulfed in Morpheus's shadow? The lethal answer never comes. Always, I'm waking up to forgetting what comes next, come the morning. Come, come the next morning, I'm waking up, forgetting that a lethal answer never comes. Always, engulfed in Morpheus's shadow, they vanish, and then you, with everything else, are roving. A shade of night. Do you want to imagine me? No, I wake to the mystery of where, in my dreams, you are dead. Letter from New York, after Elizabeth Bishop. To your city, once you stake a claim, 
rent a bed that's not for sleeping, work the job and follow street signs, down this path no one's keeping. No one's praying, I'm not cab hailing, there's true north light framing your door. The people here are wiser than moths, they say leaving early causes such an uproar. I know the city grew like a forest of pines, since no one hears you walk through either. But still, I had never been brought to a space I couldn't bear to leave, moving at my leisure. Stories here aren't mine for telling. I know you think me a lousy city scribe. But let me say, right again, I'll be waiting for your next fondly signed diatribe. And though I walk past stone, I live in brick. I dress in black and squint at all this light. Battered over the hefty concrete, we wore down, pacing through the night. The nights come back when I leave that rented bed where I'm never sleeping. I see a river flooding, washing nothing, drinks pour, and the city is weeping. Hi, my name is Claire Madden, and I'm going to be reading from my thesis project, which is a series of short essays called Measurements. The women in my family love eating just a little. My grandmother calls it having a sliver. My mother says just a bite. My younger sister says, I'm not really hungry. My older sister says she's a small appetite. My grandmother appraises a little island of pastry and ivory wrapping, takes a butter knife and slices gingerly at the sugary dough, cutting off a corner. We all watch her and roll our eyes, then do the same. My mother asks for a bite of our indulgences, ice cream or rigatoni bolognese or cinnamon bun, but will not get one for herself. She scoops a spoon or a fork deep into the dish as much as she can without feeling as though she has betrayed some sense of self-control. My older sister, Caroline, leaves a quarter or a half of whatever she eats at the corner of her plate, the corner of a turkey sandwich, a few spoonfuls of beef stew. She thinks her stomach is smaller than normal, so she does not have to eat as much to feel full. I remember when I went to visit her after she had been in Europe for another year, how much weight she had lost. My younger sister, Lindsay, tells us she is not hungry, but she ate too much already. She will share something with me or my mother, but watches for reactions. She told me once that she was expected to eat as much dessert as she did to make up for my eating nothing. My mother used to say that I was skinny mini before I was too thin. I love to hear that, the sharp rhyme before my thinness was no longer admirable or pleasant. My Aunt Pam once called me a stick insect. I couldn't tell if it was meant as an actual insult or whether she was winding me up, but I don't think it was a kindness. I wanted to thank her anyway. My sisters and I wrap our middle fingers and our thumbs around each other's wrists, seeing if they overlap. I used to be able to touch my pinky finger and my thumb. There was a time when my sister used to be able to wrap her fingers around my upper arm, see her fingers meet. We each want to see if we have a small frame. It is important to us. When I come home to visit, I ask my mother and my sister if I look like I've gained weight, if I look chunky. Lindsay rolls her eyes and my mother says, of course not. I look willowy. My sisters and I call each other tiny, short, tall, the pretty one. I have told them both that they are the pretty one, and both of them roll their eyes and say, we are all the pretty one. When someone has lost weight, my mother says they look little. It does not matter how much weight has been lost, as long as it's noticeable. When I come home with, a slight, with slightly hollowed cheeks, I look little. When Caroline visits, she looks little. When my grandmother has lost weight, she looks good, looks little. It is worry and praise. When I visit home, I step onto the scale. It is stored away under my mother's dresser. Her room is two rooms away from the kitchen, so I might have breakfast and a coffee and just quickly check. The scale feels hidden, but its silver edge gleams against the warm browns of the floor in the dresser. I think of my mother pulling on a sweater, looking at herself in the mirror just across the room, and then with one foot dragging the scale out. I know this because I do the same routine, I've been pulling this scale out from its resting place for years. Watch them, the numbers fall and climb back up again. I do not know why we have a scale in the first place, given my and my mother's and my sister's familiar hostility toward our bodies. My younger sister texted me a week ago. 
It'll be a miracle if I leave for college without a eating disorder. My mother tells me she feels like she looks chunky and asks my younger sister if she really wants pasta for dinner. My older sister eats halves of meals. I do not know why we keep a mute critic of ourselves right by the kitchen. Why my mother measures herself right next to her many pillowed bed, full of soft sweaters and socks and pajamas and floral perfumes. Now I have been looking in the mirror and seeing if I can still see ribs and then stepping onto that silver slab that measures me and my family. Why have we kept something, half hidden, that reminds us that we are not small enough? Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Morrissey, and I will be reading four poems today. The first one is called Connecticut. An Uncle Ray's hand, the rusty edge of Connecticut, unzips the belly of a flounder the same way our rich god some time ago unzipped Long Island from the rusty edge of Connecticut. Halfway down its spine, the knife catches on a scale, and the nasty dissonance of past and present is eclipsed by short coastal harmony, two waves crashing, two rivers colliding, two hurricanes dancing. The Amtrak, playing the rivers in sea, pauses in New London. The bow lifts from the violin, silence, impending storm clouds. West of the Thames, east of the Connecticut, chipped deltas jump the sound of the carotid reel spitting off dead Mary's gramophone. Vinyl, the storm surge concerto, like bare feet running from the last foamy breath of ocean water, compassing in the sand. On a beach we pretended was Normandy because our grandparents had honeyed the slaughter into a game of children. Craters became symphonic heartbeats. Scattered fireworks diverted our attention. Cardboard carcasses smoldered with the glow of percussion and Memorial Day. Mom shows me photos of distant aunts, Sandy and Irene, twirling their skirts in the music north towards Boston, wrecking each house like the alcoholic teens they were, nonetheless Catholic at the core. They were so quick to succumb at the last bar. What was left? Be beached jetsam that had never even touched the ocean. A deep fry station, hot oil economy catalyzing fish guts into Eucharist. The last vendor of shaved ice with a razor to his own neck. The jammed minute hand of a carousel, like a hesitant metronome. Its horses, stagnant buoys on the slate of water that flooded sound view. Their heads, moments from drowning. The next poem is called The River Holds. Somewhere in the absence of light you held me. God's cold hands suspending my body a moment beneath the vaulted black ice until I suffocate on the dark river matter in my lungs, until I'm cleaned out like a boar's heart, plucked Eden fruit from a basket of smashed ribs, submerged in an ice bath where two gyrating thumbs relax my captured muscle, and finally eaten out of one hand by a fur trader in New France, whose own body is, days later, scalped by another and sent off beneath thick ice. The skin of the river is permanent until spring when it refuses to hold you back. The third poem is called Ozone. I love the way the axle of his wrist turns the vortex of space with a spoon between our eyes. This moment is trapped on vinyl meditating like a mug on the microwave turntable somewhere in the background of our eyesight. The kitchen light is dark. My tongue catches me off guard when I tell him that I love him. The timer shatters, and the light of the microwave, like the nebula in his iris, disappears across the event horizon. I'm reminded that I define him by what he isn't. We cannot understand each other with our skewed gaze. The mug of waning moonlight doesn't warm my hands like I hoped it would. He remains outside my atmosphere. But later, in the fractured bedroom mirror, he bucks his palm into my chest. I let him pile drive my heart until it collapses in on its own density and his weight locks into my hip and the shrinking space between our lips cuts off the morning sun. A moment passes with new air in my throat. I glance, glacier-nosed, and bite into the clock time on his neck. 
between us in thinning layers, there is only ozone. The last poem is called Brief Cosmology. Somewhere on a sandy strip of universe, it was decided that continuing was not worth the trauma of our creation. From a small white dot, light and matter, a memory of childhood telescoped through two hands over an eye socket, peers into a future we were supposed to inherit, bleached into the dunes by two aerosol sunscreen cans we'd clutched like Christ until we were miles above Cape Canaveral, the gravity petering out. But since then, and maybe it was always that way, we've been sidelined under a stratosphere by the cloudy whims of old folk, whose scabbing sunburnt faces, one next to another, red like an orange peel map projection of pastel countries. One whiskey napalm sour, Ronald Reagan and a fat Cuban pipeline were all it took to convince them that Naples was paradise and that the, the sand stretched on forever. We'd complain about the king tide, tugging at their towels and a partition along their lips opened to tell us to respect our elders, a lazy adult hand briefly flicking, a silent flare breaking from solar skin, a great white wave dying between our toes, childhood crawling up the dune to observe the waning crescent beach chair moon, their aging laughs cleanse their tongues of responsibility. How great was their century, how great and great again. Florida might sink into the ocean, but they'd be legacies by then, and their children could still remember them far inland, even if their grandchildren wouldn't. All right, that's it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adriana Watkins, and I'm going to read one poem from my poetry thesis. It's titled Captivity, and it's about the imprisonment of St. Thomas Aquinas. Captivity. Like a tightened fist, the tower holds them over rich Italian earth, pressuring, as isolation does, with silent sorrows in battalion. The ivy vine, orange at sunset, trembles absent-minded in the breeze, stride his window, with more liberty than Thomas has, watching through the pane. Thomas, whose brother threw the key away. He sits with his reading and praying, ready for the bounce of the lock, alert to the sheepdogs down below, baying at the flock, and aware acutely of the two free marvelous shepherd walking there, back knotted, head bronzed, with a staff and a bald spot like the sun between his clouds of hair. As long as the shepherd wanders and Thomas has eyes, there will always be a man who cries in the tower at Rocaseca sometimes, when the door unopened sits, a delicate contingency, a constant if. He closes his eyes and opens hallways in his mind. There, if nowhere else, he travels free, circumvents imagined lands, gathers nations with his sturdy hands, his ears unravel simultaneously. Or better, he is in the herd, streaming homeward loud with adoration, where the author of all he learned removes his senses fetters. But day breathes out and yields a dying light across the room. Through the fields lumbers in the cumulus of sheep. The shepherd whistles one note high and thin that reaches stories up, half-conscious Thomas as he bows his head and wanders back to sleep, where friar and father meet and prisoner preaches. Thank you.